Today we're going to take a quick look at how to handle mechanisms and determining the rate law given a mechanism in the kinetics chapter. If you remember, previously I had said that a rate law and the orders of the different reactants have to be determined experimentally. And what does that mean? That means you might have data that looks something like this, where you're given the reactant, initial reactant amounts. Um, and the initial rate that's recorded in a couple different experiments. And you might have to be ter determine the rate law, and I have a previous video on how to do that, which you can reference if needed. Or you might need to know how to find the orders of the reactants uh, graphically. And you need to know that if you were to plot concentration versus time, and you were to get a straight line, that would indicate that the reaction is zero order with respect to that um, particular reactant. If you were to graph ln, natural log, of concentration versus time, and you were to get a straight line, that would indicate that the reaction is first order with respect to that given reactant. And if you were to graph one over concentration versus time, um, and you were to get a straight line, that would indicate that the reaction is second order in respect to that given reactant. We call these like characteristic plots. So you should know um, which characteristic plot goes with which order. Only one of these would best fit a straight line. So for instance, for this reaction, I plotted A versus time, the concentration of A versus time, and then the natural log of A versus time, the one over A versus time. Um, and notice only one of them gives a straight line, so that would mean that the reaction is first order with respect to A. So you can do it graphically, this is based on experimental data, or based on the data in the chart like I've showed on the previous slide, um, which you can find a video about how to do. Um, you should know either of those ways, and either of those ways we can say that's an experimental way of determining the rate law. However, there is an exception. If you were to see something about um, saying that the reaction is an elementary reaction, meaning that it occurs um, all in one step, then you can actually use the stoichiometry of the reaction to figure out the rate law. And essentially, the coefficients of the reactants just become the orders of the reactants, which is really nice as long as you remember that. So you might see something indicating all in one step, or you might see the word elementary. So what does that mean? So let's just like look at this example problem. Um, which one of the following represents an elementary reaction? So for instance, for A, if A were to represent an elementary reaction, the rate law okay, would have the word rate on the left-hand side. You'd have your rate constant, lowercase k. And then I would put the only reactant there is A, so I'd put that in square brackets to indicate concentration, and I would just be using the stoichiometry or the coefficient to write the order. That would become the exponent. So that would be the rate law if this were all to occur in just one step. And if I look at the rate law, that does not match um, the rate law predicted by stoichiometry, so this would not be occurring in an elementary step. What this means is, since the rate law differs, this is probably a multi-step reaction, um, and that's why the rate law doesn't match. So if you kind of go down the list, B, okay, B would be um, the correct answer here. Here is my rate law, rate equals K, and then I have A raised to the first power because the coefficient is 1, and B raised to the first power because the coefficient is 1, so that would be representing an elementary step. C would not be correct. Um, if the rate law were to be um, representative of that as an elementary step, it would not look like that. It would be rate equals K, just A, with no squared, um, times B squared, but that's not the case. Okay, for D it would have to have A, B, and C, and for E it would be rate equals K, A, um, B squared. So none of those other options would end up working. So if you see elementary step, you just make the coefficients become the orders. And it makes sense. So something like for B, one A particle is reacting with one B particle. Um, so you need an effective collision between an A and a B molecule. So it makes sense that the rate would be dependent um, directly proportionally with both A and B. 
Now all those other reactions are likely to be what we call multi-step reactions, meaning that they don't occur in just one step, they occur in multiple steps. And each one of those steps um, has its own rate law, and we can say each one of those steps is an elementary reaction. So let's look at how to handle a multi-step reaction. Again, to reemphasize, I have to be able to determine rate law really just from experimental data, but if they give me information about the mechanism, then I can start using some of this stoichiometry or some of these coefficients to figure out the rate law. Um, so essentially, if I have a multi-step reaction, um, the rate law is going to be governed by the slowest step. It makes sense. The reaction can only go as fast as the slow step. So you can only go as fast as the person in front of you if you're in a single line. So wherever your slow step is, that's what's going to govern the rate law. So if I look at this question 131, okay, they give you the overall reaction both on top and on the bottom. Okay, what you'll notice is that both of your steps should add up to the overall reaction. Um, and they tell you which is the slow step. So to figure out the rate law here, all I'm going to do is look at my slow step. I'm going to say, hey, that step obviously occurs all in one step. It's an elementary reaction. So I can figure out the rate law of that step just by using the stoichiometry or the coefficients become the exponents or order. So rate equals k. A has a coefficient of 1, so it has an order of 1. B has an order of 1. You can write the ones in, but you don't have to. And there's my rate law. So this would be choice C. So I'm just looking at the slow step. And notice that the stoichiometry um, of the entire reaction does not match the rate law because it's only being governed or being controlled by the slow step. And sometimes we call the slow step the rate determining step because it's limiting how fast you can go. And most of the reactions that occur, um, especially more complicated ones, are multi-step reactions. And that's why we say we typically cannot figure out the rate law just by looking at a reaction because we don't know the mechanism. It's likely multi-step and we don't know what that slow step is. And that's why something can be zero order because it might that that particular substance might not be involved at all in the slow step. So it doesn't matter if I add more of it, it's not going to speed up the reaction, even though it might be required to be there in order for the reaction to actually occur. Another thing you should notice here is that when you add up the steps to get the overall, you might have something that cancels out, um, in this case AB. AB we would call an intermediate. It's something that is made in one step and used up in a later step. So it never appears in the overall reaction. So notice AB is not in my overall reaction anywhere. An intermediate is something that would be really hard to measure in the lab because it's made and then used right up. And it's not something that you add in there to start with. Let's look at this second example. So I give you the overall reaction, okay? and I give you a possible mechanism, and I wanna know what the rate law would be. Oh, hey, the rate law is based on the slow step. So the rate law of this reaction is going to be the rate law of the slow step, assuming it occurs all in one step, which it obviously would. Rate equals K, and I would have A2 raised to the first power times A, and the square brackets mean concentration and molarity. Now, what's difficult about this, first of all, I don't even see this as an answer choice, which makes sense, is A2 in my overall reaction. Nope. Okay, I have my overall reaction has reactants A and B. So I want to make sure that my rate law is in terms of the reactants that appear in the overall reaction. A2 is an intermediate. It would be hard to measure in the lab. I don't know how much I'd be adding or it would be there. So you want to make sure you have your overall reactants. There's a really long way of doing this with equilibrium of how to solve for A2. But you can actually just do this really easily on inspection. Okay, if I go to the first reaction... Okay, if I go to the first reaction, I see A2 is being made. What actual things are making it? Oh, A and A are making it. 
A and A are reacting to get A2. So instead of having A2 in that reaction, I really could have written it as A plus A, which I'm getting from my first step. So now if I write the rate law, this is really the same thing as writing rate equals K, and then I have three A's, which is the same as A cubed. And that would be choice E. If you don't have a fast step that's first, that's at equilibrium like that, and that you're only making the intermediate, these problems can get a little more difficult and you might need um, a different way of solving it. But on inspection like this, this would suffice, especially on like an AP multiple choice question. So if your slow step to your second step, or your third step, or any step other than the first, just make sure you don't have an intermediate in your overall rate law. Let's look at this example. So in above you see there's the overall reaction and I give you the steps. Here's a fast one and typically the fast one will be at equilibrium if it's the first step. And then you have a slow one and I wanna know the rate law. Okay, I give you the mechanism. I can get the rate law from um, stoichiometry or coefficients but it's gotta be for the slow step. So the rate law of the slow step would be rate equals K NO times NOBR2. They both have coefficients of one, so they have orders or exponents of one. All right, but let's just check and make sure both of those are in my overall reaction. Hey, wait a minute. NOBR2 is not in my overall reaction. I wanna make sure that I have just NO and BR2. So what made NOBR2? If I look at what made NOBR2, it's NO and BR2. So I really could be writing those two things in place of the NOBR2. So then my rate law would become K, keep one of the NOs, and now I've added another NO, so I can make that NO squared, times BR2. And again, there could be a more complicated way of solving this with using the fact that the first step's in equilibrium and setting the rate laws of the forward and reverse reactions equal to each other, but for the most part, these are as complicated as you'll see on the AP, so this kind of um, dumbed down approach is, um, is, is totally really enough to know. And NOBR2, because it's made in one step and used up later down the line, it must be an intermediate. If you're wondering what a catalyst would look like, a catalyst is something that would be there from the start, get used up, but then get regenerated. So a catalyst might look something like, I'm just going to write A to represent a catalyst. You might have like A, okay, and it's used up in the first step, but then it's regenerated down the line. Because a catalyst is something that may react, but it's not permanently changed. It's regenerated. Okay, and homogeneous catalyst or homogeneous catalyst, however you want to say that, that's a catalyst that's in the same phase as your reactants. Heterogeneous or heterogeneous catalyst is one that is in a different phase. So an intermediate gets made, then used up, and a catalyst um, is there to start with and then is regenerated. Neither of those two things, though, are present in the overall reaction. So I hope this gave you a little bit more of a background on mechanisms.